All right, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you happen to be. We will begin momentarily as soon as a few people join the live lecture, and as soon as I get some confirmation that you can actually hear me, which is always important since sometimes things don't work quite as well as we might like, but hopefully that's not going to be a problem today. Let's see. So far, I haven't seen anybody join yet, but uh, hopefully they'll be joining in a minute. All right, I see a few people joining, so that's good. It's a good sign. Please uh, let me know if you can hear me. So I'll know that we're ready to start. If you're able to hear me, please go ahead and just type a little comment into the QA app and let me know that I'm loud and clear. Okay, super. Great. Thank you. So it sounds like we got confirmation that you can hear me. Okay, so what we're going to do today in this third live lecture for the POSA concurrency MOOC is we're going to talk about start talking about the Android concurrency frameworks and you'll we'll cover a little bit about the overall view today of the Android concurrency frameworks and then spend some time talking about the hammer framework to give you an overview of the hammer framework and then we'll start looking at an example that will illustrate how to use the hammer framework and then later this week probably Wednesday we will have another discussion where we cover the async task framework. And at that point, you'll be in a good position to be able to do the second programming assignment, which I'll be releasing here very shortly. And uh, then you'll also be able to, to uh, ask any questions that you have about assignment one or two when we have either today's lecture or the lecture about virtual office hours later this week. Okay, so let's go ahead and I'll share my screen. Go ahead and bring up the first presentation. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so that should be shared. And hopefully you can see it. So in this particular discussion, we're going to present an overview of the Android concurrency frameworks. And we're first going to spend just a little bit of time explaining what a software framework is. And as we'll see, a, a framework will be used to provide an integrated set of classes that collaborate to provide a common software architecture for a family of related applications. And then we'll talk about some of the motivations for the Android concurrency and communication frameworks, focusing primarily on the uh, concurrency frameworks. And then we're going to see how a concurrency framework provides some classes that provide a common reusable architecture for concurrent applications. So it's basically a, a variant or a refinement of the concept of frameworks for Android concurrency and concurrent applications. And then we'll talk a bit about the structure and functionality of Android's concurrency frameworks. And we'll talk about handlers, messages, and runnables, the so-called hammer framework. And we'll also talk about the async task framework. We won't talk much about uh, async task today. We'll talk about that next time. So let's start first by giving a quick overview of what a framework is. So as I said before, a framework is a set of components that provide a reusable architecture for a family of applications. You'll see that uh, there's more information here at my website about frameworks. I recommend you take a look. We're going to analyze all the frameworks, components that are shown in this slide that relate to Android concurrency in this course. We'll talk about uh, message queues and handlers and runnables and loopers and messages and so on. 
But first, let's talk a bit about what a framework actually does more generally. So frameworks are very commonly used with event-driven programs to help plug application code into some kind of framework. You can take a look here for event-driven programming and more information about that. So basically what happens is an application registers a callback or callbacks, which are objects or functions. In, in languages like C, they could be functions. In languages like Java, they're objects. In languages like C++, they could be functions or objects. And they indicate the types of events that can occur within the framework that the application wants to be informed about. And at that point, the flow of control is turned over to the framework, and it waits for things like the arrival of messages from remote servers, gestures on GUI elements, uh, updates to files, all kinds of things can happen that the framework can detect. And then it goes ahead and calls back to the application code when an event occurs. And that, in the case of Java, will be dispatched by some kind of object or some kind of handler. And the application then goes ahead and does its processing in the context of the framework's thread. So it typically borrows the thread of control of the framework unless it's a long running operation, in which case it may have to spawn a separate thread or pass it off to a thread in a pool. And when the application code is finished, the control returns back to the framework, which continues. And, and I kind of show the events here as though they're talking to different objects. And in reality, you're often talking to the same object, and this takes place over and over and over again until the application is finished. So that's kind of an overview of the steps in a framework. So let's talk a bit more about some of the key characteristics of frameworks. You can take a look here for information about framework, uh, software frameworks at Wikipedia. It has some nice explanations of what goes into a software framework. And what you'll see is that there are several characteristics that embody a framework. The most uh, central one in some ways is that they have so-called inversion of control via callbacks. And this is sometimes called the Hollywood principle. You can take a look here for an article about the Hollywood principle written by the late, great John Vlasides. And he talked about how frameworks have a structure where you don't call them, they call you. So that's, that's why it's the Hollywood principle. They call you, you don't call them, they call back to you. And what happens typically is the main thread of control, or it could be background threads, but usually it's the main thread of control, is run by the framework, and it decides when to call back to the application code. So in Android, as we'll see, there's this thing called the looper framework, and it calls back to a handler, and the handler then dispatches to runnables or other objects in order to do various kinds of things. And we'll see, take a look and see how all that works later. Something else that the framework does is it integrates domain-specific structure and functionality with the application. So in this particular case, what that means is that there's certain default capabilities that are provided by the framework that are useful to some domain or domains. Obviously, in the case of Android, the frameworks are going to focus on domains associated with mobile applications and services in support of those applications. And so there's all kinds of stuff in Android that are handled by frameworks like um, managing activities, managing services, managing content, being able to do various telephony operations, window management, location management, you name it. There's all kinds of frameworks that exist. We're obviously going to be focusing on the frameworks that relate to concurrency. But there's a lot of stuff here that, that comes along without you having to write the code, so it's reusable. Something else that frameworks do is they provide semi-complete applications or portions of applications. And that's usually done by plugging in hook methods that will provide application logic into the framework. Remember, the framework is meant to be reusable. It's meant to be general purpose, even though it may be domain specific. It's meant to be applied in multiple contexts with different applications and a family of applications. So we have to have some way of being able to provide application-specific code to the framework. And the way that that's done is by hook methods, which are essentially virtual methods that allow someone, the application or application developers, to customize the framework classes to run application-specific logic. That's what a hook method is. And you'll hear the word hook method quite a bit in the course. These semi-complete applications mediate interactions among common abstract classes and interfaces, things that are shared and reusable 
and fixed. And then there's also variant concrete classes and interfaces, which actually provide the application-specific logic. So just as a simple example, we'll see lots of other examples, but here's a simple one. In Java, there's something called a runnable, and you can use this together with the Hammer framework to provide a abstract interface, because runnable is an, is an interface, which is abstract. You have to implement it. It provides a, a hook method called run, which is virtual and, and abstract. And you have to provide an implementation of run, and then that's where the concrete application logic goes. And the framework then is responsible. The Hammer framework calls back to the appropriate um, to the run method when something happens that that the object that implements run, the concrete object, the concrete class instance, uh, cares about. Android and Java provide many many frameworks. Just as a simple example, there's this is one of dozens of frameworks. The Android Activity Framework controls the main thread of control in an application in Android. You've undoubtedly seen this before. And the framework then calls back on these app-specific lifecycle methods, like on create, on start, on stop, on destroy, and so on. And that's what's used to trigger changes in the application lifecycle. So the framework, the activity framework, knows about all this stuff. But of course, it doesn't know what to do when your activity is created. That's application-specific logic. It doesn't know what to do when your application is destroyed, but it knows when your application should be created, when your application should be destroyed, or your activity should be created and destroyed, and so on. You can take a look here for more information about the life cycle in, in Android. Another thing you can have, of course, that are frameworks are listeners for button clicks, and uh, or button presses more specifically, and they have something called a click listener, and when somebody uh, clicks on this, then that will trigger a callback by the Android windowing framework to call back to the appropriate listener to handle the button that was pressed. There's also lots of frameworks in Java. So uh, Java thread is a simple example. You have the run hook method on a runnable, and that is a method that's meant to be implemented by some concrete implementation class that overrides and implements run. And then the Android thread framework will call back the the run method, run hook method, when something interesting occurs, when a thread starts, for example. There's also something called the executor service, which we'll get some more practice with a little bit later in the next assignment. And that's used to call back to the call hook method of a callable. So run is used to call back on a runnable, call is used to call back on a callable, and there's a whole framework that handles all the concurrency and eventing underneath the hood that runs in the context of the Java executor service framework. Your apps in this, in this MOOC and other MOOCs in this sequence will apply one or more frameworks, actually often multiple frameworks. And in fact, every single Android application on the face of the earth runs inside one or more frameworks. So you can't get away from frameworks in Android. Android is very, very heavily based on the concept of framework. All right, now that we've talked about frameworks in general, let's start talking about concurrency. First of all, why do you need concurrency in Android? It turns out you really, really need concurrency in Android for a lot of different reasons. Many applications benefit, or in some cases, require concurrency. Typically, these applications perform long duration operations or access remote resources in background threads. Not often, though not always, they interact with servers that reside in, in the cloud somewhere. For example, there's lots of applications that'll play music or show videos on a device. There's ways of being able to synchronize the content of your phone database or your, your, your mobile device database with cloud servers through email, contacts, calendars, MMS, SMS, et cetera. There's ways of being able to download and store images. There's ways of being able to access web services to, to do things like find out the current weather, et cetera, et cetera. So there's all kinds of different um, mechanisms in Android and applications in Android that require concurrency to do these things in the background. Concurrency benefits applications by overlapping communication and computations. Uh, for example, one thing that they do is they increase performance they are, or they allow performance to be increased by allowing multiple threads and running multiple activities or multiple computations on multiple cores. So you can run things literally in parallel because the underlying platform will run concurrently. 
you can see some examples of multi-core processors that are available now. There's lots of multi-core stuff out there at this point for Android. They can also be used to improve responsiveness by running long duration operations in background threads. So while the application is doing stuff in the background, you can still be interacting with the user, and therefore the user interface will not be locked or frozen for any extended period of time, thereby enhancing responsiveness. You can take a look here of what happens when you're not responsive. You, you'll get an application not responding uh, exception and, and dialogue popping up that is very annoying. And then something else, a third thing that application uh, that can benefit from an Android concurrency is to simplify program structure by allowing threads to block synchronously. And uh, we'll see that this can help improve things quite a bit because you don't have to worry about asynchronous patterns and asynchronous processing in your entire application. Some things can just block until they get what they need. And it arguably leads, a more, leads to a more natural control flow and collaboration within an application. You can see more about control flow related topics here. OK, so now that we've kind of talked about why you want concurrency, let's talk about the frameworks that Android provides. But before we talk about the details of the frameworks, we first have to go a little bit further and discuss some of the constraints that Android's design imposes on applications. There are certain things that Android does that mean concurrency is very, very essential. You can take a look here for more information about these design constraints. One problem, as we mentioned before, was that the application not responding dialogue is generated if the user interface thread blocks for too long. And uh, what that means is if it blocks for more than a few seconds, three to five seconds, then you'll get this, this dialogue blocking up, uh, popping up, asking if you want to terminate the application. In fact, in some cases, it, it blows up even before three to five seconds elapse. Uh, for example, if you try to call a network operation on the UI thread, by default, that will trigger uh, the network on main thread exception. And uh, of course, there's ways of being able to disable this by changing the settings in the strict policy, but it's not advised. Another problem you have is that non-user interface threads are not supposed to access user interface toolkit components directly. Uh, I'll show you a demo of this uh, in just a second. But the idea there is that the user interface components are not designed to be thread safe. So if you try to call them from background threads, all kinds of crazy things can happen. And you can learn more about this at this link. It goes kind of into the background of why that's the case. So because of these two constraints, Android has to provide additional concurrency frameworks. And that's because the Java concurrency mechanisms, things like threading and the synchronizers we've talked about, by themselves do not address these constraints in a sensible way. If you want to learn more about Java threads, I have a nice set of tutorials that you can take a look at if you're a member of the Safari Book Club, Digital Book Club, you can see at this link that are going to provide you with all kinds of information about Java concurrency, threading and synchronization and so on. So the good news is that Android provides a couple of concurrency frameworks that help to address these design constraints. And we're going to talk more about these, these frameworks. But before we talk about the frameworks, I'm first going to show you an application called the Buggy Downloads application that motivates the need for Android's concurrency frameworks. So if you go to this link here at my uh, GitHub account, you'll find the source code we're going to look at. And you'll see that there's two, there's two uh, buttons you can push, Buggy1 and Buggy2. Not very descriptive names, admittedly, so I'm going to explain them. When you press the Buggy1 button, it will throw an exception since the image is attempted to be downloaded in the user interface thread, and that's a no-no. And if you push the buggy2 button, it'll throw an exception since a user interface component is accessed via a background thread. Now, what's funny about this is it actually does work. It does display things properly, but an exception is thrown. And, and you shouldn't write code that depends on that kind of behavior. That's a bad, bad thing. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at that code. Um, this is also probably a good time if anybody has any questions, you might want to start queuing them up because we're going to be nearing the end of this stuff shortly. So if you have some questions, probably not a bad time to, to ask them. And then I will address them when we come back. So let's go take a look at the code. Back out of this stuff. <clears throat> 
All right. So here is the source code for the buggy downloads application. So the buggy downloads application is an Android application. As you can see here, if you take a look, it uh, just has a single activity called the buggy downloads activity. And when you take a look at it, you'll see why it's buggy. So let's go take a look at the source code. I kind of split things up into two parts. It doesn't really need to be uh, very complicated. We have a couple of utility classes here that we use for various things. And then we have one activity, which I stick in the view folder just to put it someplace sensible. And uh, this particular activity, or this particular application, um, tries to, to download a bitmap image from a remote server. And it, it tries to use, well, uh, it uses using Java threads. And as we'll see, um, it's buggy. <laughs> so this implementation is buggy. And that's the intention, to show you how it works. So here's the buggy downloads activity. It inherits from something called lifecycle logging activity, which is over in the common directory. That just provides some nice diagnostics to log when various activity methods are called. We're not going to use those at the moment. Here's the default URL. It's just a link to a, a picture of me from about oh, 30 years ago or so that's kind of humorous. We have an edit text, which is the URL to download. The image view, once we've downloaded the image, and then a progress dialog box that's put to show that we're doing downloads. Here's the onCreate method. We call up to the superclass, as always, initialize the superclass, and then we go ahead and set the content view and initialize the fields. That's nothing too surprising. Here's the code that gets called when buggy1 is pressed, when the buggy1 button is pressed. Uh, we, we go ahead and get the URL the user provided, if any. It defaults to that picture of mine I showed. We hide the keyboard. We show a dialog saying that we're downloading via the buggy1 uh, method. And then we go ahead in the main thread of control, and we call download bitmap. And download bitmap is a method defined over here in common, in utils, download bitmap. I'll take it back. It's not defined there. It's defined a bit further down here. Download bitmap is defined down here. And you can see that download bitmap turns around and calls into utils download and decode image. So let's go take a look at download and decode image. That's what I was trying to find before. But here's download and decode image. This checks to see if the thread has been interrupted. Uh, if it's so, it bails out. Otherwise, it goes ahead and makes a URL object out of the string that's passed in and then calls get content, which will download the URL into an input stream. We check again to see if we've been interrupted. If not, we call bitmap factory decode stream. And that turns the input stream into a bitmap, if it's indeed a bitmap. So the problem we're going to run to, into, here, of course, here is that this is actually trying to call a networking method in the user interface thread. And that is going to end up uh, basically returning a null. And what we're going to do in that case is we're going to go ahead and post an error to the uh, UI thread. Actually, I take it back. We, we won't do that because we're going to blow up and an exception will be returned. And that exception will come over here, which is buggy1. And so we try to download the bitmap. Buggy1 throws an exception. It's going to tell us what the exception was, which will be the can't call a network operation in the main thread exception. And that's going to go ahead and show a toast. And then we're going to dismiss the process dialog. So that's what's going to happen when the buggy1 button is pushed. It's going to go ahead and blow up because we're trying to download things in the main thread. And then here's buggy2 works somewhat similarly. In this case, we're going to create a new thread, which is good, and we're going to make a new runnable. And that run method is going to download the image in the background. So far, so good. But now we're going to go ahead and call display bitmap from the background. So if we take a look at display bitmap, display bitmap is going to go ahead and try to set the image bitmap to the parameter on an image view object. And that, of course, is going to throw an exception because you're not allowed to call UI components from background threads. 
and that's going to cause this exception to be thrown. And what that'll do in this case is it will uh, go ahead. In, in this particular case, we wanted to pop a toast to show that an exception had occurred, just so you could see it visually. And uh, that has to actually run on the user interface thread for a variety of reasons. So we have to go ahead and use a bit of the hammer framework we'll talk about shortly to create a, an error runnable that will print the toast that will run on the user interface thread. Don't worry too much about this code here right yet. We'll come back and talk about how to do that stuff later. The main thing I wanted to point out here was you're not allowed to call a uh, user interface operation from a background thread. So those are a couple examples of, of buggy code that we have here that will uh, get us into lots of trouble if we're not careful. All right, so, so far there's no questions. I will then continue on. Again, though, if you, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to, to type them in uh, because you'll get a lot more of your, your uh, needs met if you actually ask questions. Okay, so let's go ahead over here, reshare my screen. Hopefully you can all see that. Alrighty. So let's continue on now with our discussion of the Android concurrency frameworks. So they're obviously going to address the problems with the buggy application, the buggy download application we just looked at. So here are a couple of different uh, things that they do. They, they decouple computations and communication by allowing long duration and potentially blocking operations to run in background threads, such as downloading images. And then they allow short duration user-facing operations to run in the user interface thread, such as displaying a bitmap. And here's basically how it's going to work. Um, there's something here that you can take a look at. Actually, this link is, is incorrect. Darn it. Thought I fixed that. Let me go ahead and fix that. This should actually be POSA 15, and it should say image downloads. And there's a couple of different image downloads. I think we'll start with simple image downloads. That's an easy one. So you might want to take a look at that. And we'll come back and look at the simple image downloads in just a second. OK. So you can have background threads performing long duration operations, to download images in this application, and you can have the uh, use of a synchronized message queue to pass results from the background thread or threads to the user interface thread where they're actually going to be displayed. So the user interface thread displays the image to the user. As I mentioned before, there's a couple of concurrency frameworks in Android. There's the handlers, messages, and runnables framework, the so-called hammer framework. And this allows operations to run in one or more background threads and have their results be published to the user interface thread. So you can spawn background threads to do long running processing. And then when those background threads finish, they can go ahead and communicate back to the user interface thread by various means, either by, by posting or calling run on UI thread or sending messages. There's a bunch of different techniques we'll talk about. There's also another framework called async task. And this is a more object-oriented concurrency framework that allows operations to run in one or more background threads and publish their results to the user interface thread. But unlike the Hammer framework, which requires the application developer to be aware of things like threads and messages and runnables and handlers and so on, the async task framework hides all of those details from the underlying application. Each of these frameworks has pros and cons. And they're both used very heavily throughout Android. I, I will come back later and talk about pros and cons in another, another lecture, probably uh, later this week or next week. But uh, be aware that no one size fits all. So there's good and bad about both, both types of frameworks. Both frameworks also implement a bunch of concurrency idioms that are specific to Android. Take a look here. You can find out what an idiom is. An idiom is basically a pattern that's specific to a particular context, such as a design method, a platform like Android, a language like Java, C++, um, or ML. You know, there's different patterns for different styles of languages. For example, one of the patterns you see in Android concurrency frameworks in the async task framework is the ability to send 
messages between threads via this send to target method, which can be used to pass messages between threads. That's an Android specific way of passing things between different threads. Patterns and idioms are also needed, not just to implement the framework, but to use the framework effectively. And uh, one of the things we'll talk a lot about in this class are what happens when runtime configuration changes occur, when you, when you rotate the phone's orientation, and there's certain ways you have to handle that properly. Uh, one thing you also have to think about is how you're going to store messages. Uh, if you handle messages called, we'll talk about this later, but you have to make sure that you, you copy messages in a, if you're going to store them um, beyond a callback to handle message. So that's an example of a, of a programming idiom that we'll talk about later. Okay, let's kind of finish up this section with a discussion of some of the elements of the Android concurrency frameworks. There's a whole set of classes that Android concurrency frameworks use. Both the Hammer framework and the async task framework share many of these classes. Some classes are visible to the users, like the handler class, messages, runnables, executor, and so on. And we're going to cover um, these classes primarily at the beginning. And then there's also some classes that are invisible, like loopers, message queues, future task, and so on. And we're not going to talk about them this week. We're going to talk about them more when we discuss how the framework is actually how the frameworks are implemented under the hood. I'll quickly talk about all the different things here, though, so you get a bird's eye view of what's going on. So there's something called a looper, which is used to run a message loop for a thread. In Android, if you want to be part of the Android concurrency frameworks, you have to have a thread with a looper in it. And we'll talk later about how you get a looper into a thread. Every looper contains a message queue, and that's used to hold the list of messages that are to be dispatched by the looper. And we'll talk about how dispatching works later. You pass information from one thread to another or from one thread to itself by using a message, which is an object can, that contains data and type information that can be sent via a handler. And it uses the looper's message queue under the hood to, to pass the information appropriately between threads or from one thread to itself. There's also something called the handler, which is really the main user-facing interface that you'll experience if you program with a hammer framework. And that allows sending and processing of message and runnable objects in the message queue that's associated with the thread's looper. There's a runnable, which you're probably familiar with already, that represents a command that can be executed either in the same thread or a different thread. And all the classes we just talked about are all used in the Hammer framework. There are some other classes that are just used by the async task concurrency framework. There's something called future task, which is a very powerful Java concurrency mechanism that can be used for several things. It can be used to start and cancel a computation that runs asynchronously. It can be queried to see if a computation is done. And if it is done, it can be used to retrieve the results of the computation, whether it succeeded or failed. And then there's finally something else called the executor framework, which is yet another framework that comes from Java that can be used to execute runnable tasks either sequentially uh, on one thread or concurrently in a pool of threads. These frameworks are used by Android's application frameworks and packaged applications. In other words, the things that come out of the box that are part of Android. And of course, you'll use them yourself as well for various things. And then Android itself applies many patterns to help overcome design constraints and ensure other benefits of concurrency. You can take a look here for more information on concurrency patterns. We'll be covering a lot of these patterns later in the course. Okay. So that was the discussion about Android's concurrency frameworks at a high level. There are a handful of questions here, which I'll be happy to take. If anybody else has any questions, please, uh, please feel free to, to ask them now. So let's start by taking some questions. What book do you recommend for a deeper study of data structures in Java? Uh, that's a great question. I, I don't teach the data structures course here at Vanderbilt, but I'm sure if you uh, Google data structures in Java, you'll find dozens and dozens of, of books that will explain how to do how to do uh, data structures in Java. In fact, there's actually a, a Coursera MOOC now that just started by the University of California in San Diego that covers uh, 
data structure and algorithm programming using Java. So that's probably a very good place to look. Is there always one looper per thread, or can there also be more? There is always only one looper per thread, and that particular design constraint is enforced by something called thread local storage in Java, which is itself an implementation of something called the thread-specific storage pattern. And so we'll talk later about thread-specific storage, and we'll talk about thread local storage, and I'll show you uh, in, in a later video next week how all this stuff is implemented underneath the hood. Is a message queue the same as an event queue in event-driven programming? So uh, obviously, it, it depends. Um, in event-driven programming, that's obviously a, a concept, right? Event-driven programming is a concept that is then realized by various mechanisms. Uh, for example, in Android, you have event-driven programming that's implemented by the Android Activity Framework and the concurrency mechanisms we're talking about here, in particular, the, the Hammer Framework. And it turns out that the message queue that's used in the Hammer Framework is indeed the same message queue that's used to store various kinds of user interface events and other types of events in the Android Activity Framework. So the Android Activity Framework uses the underlying hammer framework and its message queue to dispatch many different kinds of events. But keep in mind also that uh, message queues in Android can also be used for things that are not related to the main user interface event queue. So the event queue that's provided for every application activity uh, via its main thread of control, its so-called UI thread, that's one use of message queues in the Android hammer framework. But there are other uses of message queues in the Android Hammer framework. And so it's important to uh, understand how that stuff works. And we'll take a look at some of that later as well. Let's see, next question. Uh, this, this goes back to my discussion I said before about uh, trying to call networking operations from the main thread of control. Is the error when trying to execute a network operation just happening when using standard Android network methods? Or does it happen when using external libraries? So I think that if you call the standard Android networking method, you'll actually get that exception because those standard um, methods probably have a check internally to make sure that they're not being called from the user interface thread. You can disable that check by changing the strict policy to allow uh, basically network operations or blocking operations in the user interface thread. That is not a very good idea, by the way, but you can do it. Um, my guess is if you start calling out to third-party libraries, they probably don't do those checks because they don't know anything about Android. But if you happen to call to a third-party library and that third-party library would block for an extended period of time, then you'll still get the application not responding dialog popping up because you took too long to run. So you may not get that ex specific exception, but if things take too long to run, you're still going to get a uh, an ANR and you're going to have to, an a ANR is application not responding event, and you'll have to figure out. Uh, how to deal with that. So the best rule of thumb, of course, is don't call networking operations in the user interface thread, and your life will be oh so much better. OK, well, that was that round of questions. Again, um, I, I strongly, strongly encourage people to ask questions. That's sort of the beauty of the, uh, the live lecture. If you don't ask questions, you're really missing out on the whole point of the live lecture, which is to give you a chance to learn things that you wouldn't necessarily get just by watching the videos. What let's do now is we're going to go ahead and start the next section of slides, which I will open up here and start in a second. So in this section, we're going to talk about the Android Hammer framework in general briefly, and then we're going to focus in on the Android Handler class. So we'll talk about what the idioms and programming mechanisms are relating to the Android Hammer framework, focusing largely on the handler class, because that's the typical main interface you see when you interact with the Hammer framework. Other classes in the Hammer framework will be covered in more detail in later videos, probably next week. So let's start by talking about why we need this thing. So user interface and background threads often need to interact with each other for a variety of different reasons. For example, they might want to initiate concurrent operations so the user interface thread can trigger the download of some 
long running operation in a background thread. You may also want to have threads interact to coordinate their behavior. So for example, the, the background thread can inform the user interface thread when the image downloaded triggered is complete. So those are examples of, of reasons why you might want to communicate. The Hammer framework supports these types of use cases. So it allows background threads to send messages or post runnables to the UI threads message queue via handlers. And the UI threads looper then coordinates with a handler to process the messages and runnables. If you use the Hammer framework in Android, you often don't need to use any Java synchronization mechanisms at all. It's all built for you, and those mechanisms are used internally to the Android concurrency frameworks, which works for many kinds of applications, though, of course, not all of them. Once the message is received, then the looper is going to take the message out of the message queue, and then it'll use the handler to actually process or dispatch these requests to the appropriate object. You could also use the Hammer framework to post messages or runnables to itself. It doesn't always have to be posting things to, uh, to other threads. It can also post it to itself. And that's usually used to have deferred processing of runnables and messages. Background threads can also interact via handlers. This is not a very common use case, but it's certainly possible. And you can have background threads that have no interaction with user interface threads talking to each other quite nicely through, through handlers using uh, basically an, an active object like programming model. So let's talk a bit about the handler class. The handler is what's actually used as the primary interface for sending and processing messages and runnables in one or more threads. Every looper in Android has a message queue. And we'll talk more about that later. The message queue is what's used to queue up information, queue up messages or runnables sent to it by threads, either the main thread, the UI thread, or other, other background threads. And these threads that are placed on the message queue are then taken off and processed. And it's the job of the handler to manage the message queue. And it does this in conjunction with a looper. And we'll see more about that later. So the handler is used to add and remove messages in a message queue and dispatch the messages to their intended targets. A handler is always associated with a particular looper, and a handler is also associated with a particular thread. By default, the looper that's used is the one where the handler was created. If you create a handler in a thread, by default, it's associated with the looper in that thread. So if you're inside a thread, like the UI thread or the a background thread, and you make a handler, it binds by default to that thread's looper. If that's too restrictive, then you can also create a, you can also have a way of being able to associate the handler with different loopers by passing the looper as a parameter to the handler constructor. And we'll take a look later about things that do that. It's kind of cool. There are two main things that a handler does. One thing it does is it can be used to send messages and post runnables to the thread's looper, that's one thing it can do. So you can either send a message or you can post a runnable. And we'll talk more about those things later. And then internally, the looper's message queue in queues and schedules the runnables or messages for future execution by, by the thread that receives them. Or you can also um, collaborate with a looper to serialize the processing of messages in a thread. So this is something that only takes place for uh, message sending but uh, you can actually arrange to have a hook method called back on a handler that will process a message that was sent to it from either itself or from another thread. And each message or runnable that's used here keeps track of its associated handler. So they always know which handler is going to be used to do the actual dispatching. And we'll take a look later to see how that works. It's kind of cool. And it demonstrates how some of the features of Android's messages are designed. If you follow the design rules and idioms of using the Hammer framework, concurrency control can be greatly simplified because there's no need to lock anything. As we said before, objects in different threads can interact via their handlers. They can exchange messages and runnables via the handlers that are associated with each other's looper. Under the hood, there's a bunch of interesting concurrency patterns that are used to implement these frameworks. Some of the most 
important patterns are the command processor pattern that appears in the POSA 1 book and the active object pattern that appears in the POSA 2 book. And you can also read these things online if you don't have those books. But I, I strongly encourage you to get the books. Lots of great stuff in there. So let's talk about some of the methods in the handler class. There's a lot of methods in handler. There's about two dozen different methods. And you can categorize these methods into four main categories. And we'll talk about some of these things in more detail when we get a little further along in terms of the patterns that they embody. Some methods are used to post and remove runnables. So one of the things you can do with a handler is you can post a runnable to it. And that runnable is then sent to the target of the handler. And that target handler then goes ahead and dispatches the runnable and calls its run hook method. One method, as we'll see later, can be used to just post the runnable. It goes to the end of the queue. You can also post runnables to the front of the queue. You can post runnables that will run at a specific amount of time in the future. And you can also remove runnables that have been posted uh, previously if they're still in the queue. Underneath the hood, it uses this thread local looper and the handler to dequeue each runnable and dispatch its run hook method. And we'll see how that works later. That is basically the command processor pattern. There's also a way of sending and removing messages. Uh, for example, you can insert a message into a queue at the end. You can also put the message into the queue at the front. You can put the message into the queue with a delay. And you can also remove messages that are pending as long as they haven't left the queue. A message is more interesting than a runnable. A runnable only has a single method called run, whereas a message can contain all kinds of data that can be passed and then ultimately processed by the handler's handle message hook method. And we'll see how this is used later to implement a different style of pattern, which is basically the active object pattern or a variant of the active object pattern. And we'll talk about these patterns in more detail later. You could also use some of the methods on handler class to as factories to obtain messages with various parameters. And these are used to create messages that are passed to the send message method. This is basically a, a creational pattern or a factory pattern. And then there's also some methods that are used to dispatch messages and runnables. There's a method called dispatch message that's used internally, and that's used to actually get the handle message method called back. And as we'll see later on when we talk about um, how this works, the dispatch method will dispatch both runnables and messages. And this is the logic. I'm not going to go through this in a lot of detail right now, but we'll talk about the details of how this works when we talk about the internals. The messages and runnables are processed in the context of the thread that's associated with the handler. So remember, a handler is always associated with a particular thread. And so when a method is called, then when, when a message is sent or a runnable is posted, then the callback takes place in the thread where the handler runs or resides that's associated with the post or send message call. We're going to talk about the internals in much more detail later. Let's talk a little bit about how these things get used. There's obviously a decision to make when you're writing your code. Do you use runnables or and post them or do you send messages? Typically, you use post to send a runnable or to post a runnable when the sender knows what operation to perform. So it has an operation it wants performed, it knows what needs to be performed, and it just wants that operation to be run in the right context, say in a user interface threads context or at some future point in the future. And we'll talk about this in much more detail later. You typically use send message in contrast when the receivers know what operation to perform. So if the sender doesn't know, it just knows it has something it wants to be processed by a receiver, then you go ahead and send a message, and then the receiver will go ahead and process the message. And we'll take a look at some examples of how that works later on. In general, sending and receiving of messages is a bit more powerful than posting runnables. These handlers and the hammer framework are used extensively throughout Android. And uh, we're going to talk about how the Hammer framework uses handlers when we talk about future uh, topics a little bit later, probably next week. And the async task also actually uses the Hammer framework internally. So the async task layers an object-oriented programming abstraction on top of the Hammer framework to alleviate some of the complexity of programming to the Hammer framework directly. 
There's also other places to go on the web to find out more about handlers and hammer framework. And uh, you can take a look at some of the tutorials here and, and other places as well. OK, so that is the end of that topic. Uh, if there's any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Otherwise, what we will do is we will continue on with the next discussion. So if you have a question, feel free to post it. Otherwise, I will go ahead and queue up my next talk. All right, looks like everybody's clear on what we're covering so far. That's good. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to post them. OK, so if you have other questions, uh, feel free to post them. I'll, I'll cover them at the end. What we're going to do now is we're going to talk about an example to illustrate how to use the various concurrency mechanisms that Android provides. And this example is a simple example that can be used to download images and then display them on your device. And once it's downloaded, they'll be displayed. And we're going to look at two different implementations of this application. Uh, we're not going to cover both implementations today. We're going to cover one part of one implementation today to talk about the Hammer framework. And then we'll finish up that example after we talk about the, the uh, async task framework, and then we'll show the other example even later because it's, it's more sophisticated and more powerful. All right, so let's first talk about this application. This application will demonstrate multiple ways to download an image concurrently. We'll first show how to post and process runnables. We'll next show how to do this by sending and handling messages. And then finally, we'll show how to use it by executing async tasks. Uh, in all the different variants, the user is prompted for the URL for the image. And then they can select which mechanism they want to use. Let's say they want to run by using async task. And that'll then either let you type in, a, type in a URL or it'll take one by default, which is a funny picture of me from a long time ago. And when you start to do the download, you get a, a little toast pops up to say what's happening. Once the image is downloaded, it is then displayed on the user interface in the UI thread. And then if you want to, you can reset the image back to the original image. The magic all happens inside this uh, image downloads activity, which is the workhorse that does all the different processing. There's a couple different ways to do all this stuff, of course. And let's quickly talk about sort of how this is structured. So there's a image downloads project, which has three main elements, like all projects do. Part, of course, is the source code, which is the most creative part. It's the most freeform part written in Java. There's a bunch of resource files that control the static content used by the Java code. So it'll say how to do the layouts, how to internationalize strings, how to put uh, default bitmaps, and so on and so forth. You could learn more about that here. I'm assuming people already know how resources work in Android, so I'm not going to cover them. If you have questions, go back to the first, MOOC, first two MOOCs by Professor Porter. There's also an Android manifest file that contains all the information in Android and the Android runtime environment needs to execute the application written in, in XML. And uh, here's some of the stuff that we would put into our image downloads application manifest file. We would say what package it's in. We would grant permission to use the internet, which, by the way, is now the default behavior with Android M and later. But with earlier versions of Android, you have to explicitly grant permission. You could also declare a bunch of intents that the activity is going to expose to other users. In this case, we're going to have one activity, the image downloads activity, which is exposed. And then it, we have an intent filter that says this is what's launched when you click the Start button. There's an image downloads activity XML file that specifies how the resources are going to be laid out. And it indicates what the text is and the buttons and so on and how they're laid out on the screen. It also can be used to map methods to buttons. We'll see if you look at this file that there's ways to map the methods to the buttons themselves. And uh, there's all kinds of ways to do this. This particular approach does not require hard coding the uh, mapping into the source code, although there's some drawbacks to this approach if you have more complex applications where things, uh, where buttons come and go to based, based on the context in which they're being used. So let's talk about the apps. We're going to see there's two different versions. The first one is called Simple Image Downloads. And this is the one we're going to look at first. 
this basically showcases all three variants of the hammer and async task framework within a single activity. There's a way to download and display images via handlers and runnables. There's a way of being able to download and display an image via handlers and messages. And there's a way of downloading and displaying images via an async task. So we'll take a look at that stuff first. This solution is intentionally simple. It doesn't handle any runtime configuration changes. And uh, so you, you would not want to use this in production code. It just illustrates primarily how the mechanisms work. There's then a much more interesting application that implements the same semantics that's based on the model view presenter pattern that we're going to be using throughout this class. And you can get that implementation here. And this solution uses the oops, MVP pattern, not the MPV pattern, MVP pattern to handle runtime configuration changes. So if you rotate your screen, for example, this will handle that very gracefully and cleanly. And it, all, it has three layers. It has the view layer, which is where the activity lives. It has the presenter layer, which is where all the concurrency models live and concurrency implementations live. And then it has the model layer, which is the part that actually interacts with the remote web server where the, image, the images are stored. So those are the three main layers. And this approach here handles rotations cleanly. So we'll cover that one later. OK, so let us now go take a look at this source code. Let me first go find the source code. And then we will share the screen. So here is the source code for this project. This is the simple image download. We're going to look at this first. We've already looked at the manifest file. Let's just go look at the source code. Once again, we've got some common stuff, and we've got some view stuff. Uh, I'm putting everything in the view uh, package, although in, in real life, I would never write code like this. This is just to show the key points without getting too much into the detail of the MVP pattern. So this particular activity implements these three different concurrency strategies. Download with runnables, which is the hammer framework. Downloads with messages, which is the hammer framework. And download with async task, which is the async task framework. After the image is downloaded and converted into a bitmap, it's displayed. And this approach does not handle runtime configuration changes. So you have to see the other example to see how to do that. Here's the code. It extends lifecycle logging activity, as always like we did in the buggy download example. It has a link to the URL that we use by default. It has the URL to download as an edit text, the view to show, and the progress dialog to indicate that we're making some forward motion here. The on create method is pretty much normal. We initialize the super class, as always. Update the layout content view, grab hold of the various uh, widgets that we need to edit the text and view the image. And we've got a couple of different methods that are called back when user clicks the button. So here's the run runnable method. And there's also a run messages method and a run async task method. We're only going to look today at run runnable and run messages. We're not going to look at the async task stuff because we haven't covered that yet. We'll come back and look at that later. So here's what it looks like. This looks actually very similar to the buggy version we did before. It gets the user interface. The user input for the string hides the keyboard, says we're downloading via runnables and handlers. And then it goes ahead and it starts a new thread. And this thread will run a runnable that's created here, passing in this activity and this URL. And that runnable will then be started and it'll go ahead and run in its own thread. So that's how we run something via the runnable. And then here's the same basic idea except this uses the messages. And I guess I better put my little dialog box here, otherwise people won't know what's happening. Handlers and messages. And this one up here should say handlers and messages. Oops, runnables. There we go. So like the run runnables call, this goes ahead and makes a new runnable called download with messages, passing in the activity and the URL to download, and it starts that and it runs it in a thread. And then here's some of the helper methods we're going to use. This is called download bitmap. 
this is going to basically uh, download the image and decode it and turn it into a bitmap. And if that all works according to plan, we're going to go ahead and display this thing in the user interface screen. And of course, this is going to be much more clever than the version we did before, the buggy versions, because it's going to run stuff in the background properly. And it's also going to do the various display operations in the foreground in the UI thread properly. OK, so these other methods are just helper methods. We reset the image. We get the URL string. We start the dialog. We dismiss the dialog. All right, so let's go take a look now at download with runnables. Download with runnables implements runnable, so it's got a run method. It stores the URL that we want to download. And it also stores a weak reference to the activity that created it. And it stores this as a weak reference to ensure that the activity can be garbage collected properly. If you don't make this a weak reference, the activity will not be garbage co collected properly when you rotate the phone. Not that this example really handles phone rotation correctly, but I'm just showing the idea here to get you accustomed to the idea. Here's download with runnables. It just stashes away the various fields. And uh, I guess I should make this a final because these are stored in the constructor. Here's the run method. This uses the hammer framework, and it uses the handlers and runnables approach. It goes ahead, and the run method, keep in mind, the run method runs in the background in the thread that was created by the activity. And because it's in the background, it's perfectly OK to call download bitmap. So it, notice it's calling back to the activity to get the bitmap. So that method is shared by all the different strategies. So it gets the image if, if one exists, assuming it works. It then goes ahead and it creates a new runnable whose run method will run in the UI thread, because we're calling the Hammer Framework's run on UI thread method. And that's also being called on the main activity. And that's going to then send this runnable using the Hammer Framework back to the UI thread. And in the context of the UI thread, the run method will be called. And that will go ahead and dismiss the dialog and display the bitmap. So the bitmap image will then properly get displayed. And uh, that will then do that in the user interface thread. So that's how we do download with runnables. You can see it's very, very simple. It's doing this in the background, and then it's communicating back to the UI thread via the hammer framework to call run on UI thread. And then here's download with messages, which is very similar to download with runnables. Um, the main difference, of course, is it's using messages, not runnables. So again, we have the string and a weak reference. And then we have a couple of fields, a couple of static fields that we use to pass as the what type information for the messages we're exchanging. Here's the message handler we're going to create. We create a new handler called message handler, or M message handler. And this has a method, a hook method, called handle message. And this message, handle message method, will get called back in the user interface thread. And that is going to be used to do the various operations that the user interface thread needs. Notice this gets called back in the user interface thread because it's going to be defined in the, it's going to be defined here in this object. So when this object is created, when, when download with messages is created, which is created here, download with messages is created in the user interface thread. So we haven't, this is not created in a background thread. It's created in the user interface thread. So as a result, the handler that's created here will be associated with the user interface threads looper. So that's where that gets done. We'll see in a minute when handle message gets called back, it's going to take a look at the message type, which is one of these fields. And depending on what it sees, it's going to either show a dialog, dismiss the dialog, or display an image. And all this stuff takes place in the user interface thread. Here's the download with messages constructor. It goes ahead and it creates the message. You can see here. And then the run method that gets called here is what gets called in a background thread. And this is going to use the handler to get a message with the what field to be show dialog. And then it's going to send that message to the message handler, which of course will pop up in the user interface thread via the callback to handle message which will then go ahead and show the dialogue. 
and it goes ahead and it downloads the image in a background thread. And when it gets the image, it'll then get another image to say, dismiss the dialogue, and it'll send that to the um, main thread and say, hey, dismiss the dialogue, which will get run here to dismiss the dialogue. And then the last thing it'll do, it'll create a message and it'll send that message to the user interface thread to tell it to display the image. That'll then be sent to the user interface thread. And when that's received, that message will cause it to display the bitmap in the context of the user interface thread. Okay, so that's basically the code we're going to look at thus far. We'll, we'll come back, of course, later and we'll look in more detail at, um, at other stuff related to async task, but this is just to give you an overview of how the hammer framework behaves and, and how, how simple it is for simple kinds of operations like this. Okay, so at that point, we're now done with all the lecture material and uh, that I had planned to cover today. So what I'm gonna do is take some questions. We have a couple of questions that came in here. So one question, very good question. How do Art and Dalvik differ in terms of dealing with threads? They don't really differ with in terms of dealing with threads. Both uh, both packages basically call a bunch of native code that under the hood will create threads using the uh, the underlying pthreads mechanisms that Linux supports on Android. So they're really not different at all in terms of threads. What mechanism handles sizing the looper's message queue? As far as I know, the message queue that the looper uses is unbounded. So as long as you keep putting stuff into it, it'll keep growing and growing and growing. Obviously, if you put too much stuff into it, you will eventually run out of memory in your program, but uh, that's probably gonna take a, a while. Uh, obviously, if you have a program that's generating events faster than you can process them, uh, you've got a bug on your hands and you have to figure out a way to handle that. Oh, here's a very good question. These are good questions, by the way. Runnables and messages are posted and sent to the same looper. Uh, the answer, of course, depends on whether they're posted and sent to the same handler, because that's really what matters. Remember, every handler is associated with a specific thread, and every thread that's part of the, the Android concurrency framework has a looper and one looper. So therefore, if you pass a message to a handler, that's part of the same thread, by definition, it'll go to the same looper. Moreover, if you have multiple handlers that are associated with the same thread, which occurs if you either create all the handlers in the same thread, or you create a handler with a looper passed in from the same thread, then they will also all be processed by the same looper as well. So there's actually a, a many to one relationship possible between handlers to threads and loopers. There's always a one-to-one -one association between a thread and a looper, but there can be a many-to-one relationship between handlers and loopers. Uh, and so if you pass, if you post a message, or sorry, if you post a runnable or you send a message to a handler that's part of the same thread as another handler that's posting or sending uh, messages and runnables and so on, they will all end up being processed by the same looper. If you don't like that behavior, then create separate threads and create separate handlers that are associated with those separate threads. And those separate handlers will then uh, be ending to different threads and different loopers. And we'll talk about how to do that when we uh, get into the more sophisticated internal use cases of, of Android. Are objects created in one thread always accessible in another thread? No, absolutely not. Uh, they would have to be explicitly made available to another thread, either by using some variable that's shared between the threads in uh, some, some means. There's lots of different ways you could do that by some kind of shared data structure that you keep references to. Or you could also pass the uh, objects in messages or runnables that you pass from one thread to another as well. So you can always pass objects uh, through messages or runnables. So that's another way to pass them between threads. When the download of the runnables has a weak reference to the activity, how is it guaranteed to call download bitmap on the activity? Well, it's not guaranteed to call download bitmap on the activity. Uh, if the activity happens to be garbage collected because ro uh, rotation occurs, then that weak reference will be will turn out to be null, and so an attempt to call uh, 
bit, download bitmap or display bitmap will fail. And so, of course, production code needs to be prepared for that. And the typical thing you do, by the way, to be prepared for that is you need to be prepared to catch a null pointer exception in your, your code that runs in a background thread that's accessing the activity through a weak reference. And about the only thing you can do in that case is typically log that information. Uh, there are more powerful things you can do with uh, more sophisticated frameworks that we'll talk about later with respect to things like the model view presenter pattern. But uh, those things require additional knowledge that we'll cover uh, shortly. But that's not what we're covering right now. Oh, here's a good question. Why do we use the Hammer framework at all? Async task seems easier to work with. I, I agree with you. I use async task pretty much exclusively for almost everything I do. Uh, however, if you take a look at Android, you'll see that there's absolutely tons of uses of the Hammer framework. And uh, there are various reasons for that, both good and bad reasons for doing that. Um, I'm actually not a fan of the Hammer framework for anything other than simple things like passing messages uh, or passing you know, error information from a background thread to the user interface thread or, or other simple things like that. Um, I much, much, much prefer to use the async task framework. But some people prefer to use the Hammer framework. And when we talk about evaluating pros and cons of Android later in the course, probably next week, uh, you'll get a better idea of, of why there are the different approaches, because they do have pros and cons. The, the Hammer framework is uh, arguably easier to use for very simple things, especially for things like posting runnables. It's really simple to do. Um, whereas the async task framework requires a little bit more knowledge on your part about how to subclass stuff and, and a few extra methods to fill in and so on and so forth. So it's a little bit more complicated, arguably, but um, they can be used in almost identical ways. Although for my money, the, can, the async task framework tends to scale up in a much better way than, than the hammer framework does. Okay, well, looks like those are all the questions that we have so far. Uh, if you have any more questions, feel free to post them to the discussion forum. Otherwise, we'll be doing the next live lecture and virtual office hour on Wednesday. And I'll send out an announcement here shortly with uh, the dial-up information, the contact information to, to access the, the next session. We'll also talk more about programming assignment number one in the next session. So if you have any questions about that, then, of course, don't hesitate to, uh, to bring them or post them to the discussion forum. Thanks very much for joining.